All right, Gary Brecka, I've wanted you on for a long time, man. I got to ask you, you know, you've awesome. changed your stance on a few things. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of does. What are a few things in the last five, seven years you sort of changed your perspective or maybe your opinion on? So after today's video, our sponsor is Seed. I put a link down below for 25% off their daily symbiotic. So it's a probiotic and a prebiotic in one. So it has a really unique delivery system. So I am a fan of probiotics when you're making a change to like your diet or a lifestyle because it can kind of help remodel that gut microbiome to help you make that shift a little bit sooner. Now, full disclaimer, they're a sponsor on this channel. That's how this channel works. It's how we're able to create amazing content. But my promise is that I only recommend products that I personally have used or currently use. So seed down below, that is a 25% off discount link, again, for their daily symbiotic. I would probably guess that you'd notice a difference within about a week of taking it. Start noticing it digestively, you might start noticing it in other ways, but for me, I got more energy, I started sleeping better, things just seemed more regulated. So anyhow, that link down below, 25% off. Um, probably a big one would be intermittent fasting. Um, you know, I, I think like everything in, in, in the biohacking world, you know, something that has a really, really positive implications gets taken to the extremes, you know, um, you know, Cold plunging now is about how cold can you make the water and how long can you stay in, not about just cold shocking the body. And, and I think the same thing has happened intermittent fasting. And I really evolved my stance on intermittent fasting because of Dr. Walter Longo's work, um, not just the longevity diet and all the work he did in the blue zones, but also some of the, you know, the, the published studies that he's done on, on fast mimicking versus actual very short feeding windows. When I say m modified my stance on intermittent fasting, um, I'm still a huge believer on, you know, 12 hour, um, you know, minimum periods where you're not fed. Um, but I think for a while, and if you look back at a lot of, a lot of the videos and, and early interviews that I did, you know, I was really preaching a very, very narrow feeding window. And as our clinics got more data, especially in females, um, young menstruating females, when we, we realized the endocrine disasters that were coming from very, very narrow um, feeding windows. And, um, you know, especially given that, you know, their cycle during different phases of the month, we, we saw absolute endocrine disasters. And then as you really start to dig into the science, um, you know, it's cyclical fasting, you know, three day water fast a few times a year, um, fast mimicking and, and actually widening your feeding window and spreading your caloric intake out over a prolonged period of time and still giving your body 12 or 13 hours off would be, I think something that would be a change in stance, um, you know, for me, whereas, you know, before I was even advocating down to one big meal a day um, and in a very, very prolonged period of autophagy and um, to reduce cellular senescence. Um, but I don't think that the, that the real data is, is continuing to support that. Yeah, when you look at, Fasting, what would you recommend someone that still enjoys intermittent fasting, just maybe as a lifestyle or whatnot? Do you recommend a few days per week? What kind of window would you recommend these days? So, I mean, if you look at Dr. Walter Longo's work, I mean, he's he's clearly demonstrated um, that if, if you're if you're want to eat for longevity, right? I mean, so it's like anything, like there's no specific intermittent fasting that fits everybody's, you know, not everybody should be on 12 hours. Certainly not everybody should be on four hours. You can restrict that window depending on your glycemic profile. So if you're morbidly obese, you're um, hypertensive, you have um, very high hemoglobin A1C, three month average of your blood sugar, really elevated glucose, then shortening the window is very beneficial for you. But if you have a high level of insulin sensitivity, and let's say your hemoglobin A1C, your the three month average your blood sugar is 4.8 or 4.9, which is right on the average of being hypoglycemic part yeah. of the time and, and normopathic blood sugar part of the time. Because you have to remember that these three-month averages are just that, they're averages, right? So if your hemoglobin A1C is 4.8, and you go, well, that's great. That's the lowest end of the range. Well, that means that half the time you're below that number and half the time you're above that number. And these prolonged periods of hypoglycemia, have, there is no question that it has a detrimental effect on um, the pituitary's regulation of uh, thyroid hormones and thyroid hormones regulation of the metabolism. And you see that um, really, really strict feeding windows, especially in people that have high level of insulin sensitivity, um, really, um, slows their metabolism down. You see their T3s and T4s start to slow down. I mean, the pituitary is interpreting this as starvation and really trying to slow the person's metabolism down. So I think what we need to do, I'm a huge fan of data, right? Um, because, 
you know, not all human beings are exactly the same way. I mean, the biggest fallacy in all of modern medicine is what goes into your body and goes into my body and goes into everybody else's body is treated exactly the same way. You're just going to have a hard time convincing me that the nose tackle for the Green Bay Packers, you know, somebody might be 6'5 and 330 pounds and my five-year-old 49-pound niece are going to get the exact same dosage of the exact same thing and have the exact same reaction. And I think that's true with intermittent fasting too. Um, I think that we – we should get data. I mean, first of all, if we get data, we can measure it. And what's measurable, we can change. And so um, I think you look at your glycemic profile, your, your glucose, your hemoglobin A1C, and your insulin. You find out where you fall on, am I insulin resistant? In which case, you know, um, an intermittent fasting uh, protocol with a, with a more narrow feeding window could be the, a lifesaver. Um, but if I'm hypoglycemic, you know, prolonged uh, narrow feeding windows could could cause a serious endocrine disaster, could even cause a metabolic disaster. So I would say as a blanket statement, um, 12 hours on, 12, 12 hours off, right? Is it and doing that on the daily, statement. right? And doing that on the daily. Yeah. And I think that, and a lot of people will say, that's not fasting. But if you look at most people, I mean, people that are in maybe the, the fasting sphere that mm -hmm. understand intermittent fasting will say, mm -hmm. well, that's not fasting. But yeah, if, you were, if you were to talk to the general population, they would consider 12 hours of fast. Yeah. And that's my baseline too. I'm like, it's every day, like without really an exception, like it's a 12, 12 as my baseline. And right. then if I want to modulate it from there up and down, you know, I might, but that's just the baseline. Yeah. I mean, if you're a super woke biohacker, I mean, and by woke, I mean, just you're very aware um, of, you know, you've got data on your body and you're exercising regularly and you've dialed in your sleep and you're measuring your, your, you know, your, your sleep scores and you're making adjustments, you're properly hydrated, you're supplementing well, you're on a regular exercise routine. Th that's not really the crowd that we're, we're we're addressing. I mean, they're they're dialed in, and I mean, they're they're using fasting as that next tool to tighten, you know, tune in the radio station. But I'm talking to if if the masses, you know, um, if if middle class America just ate from eight in the morning till eight at night, believe it or not, that would have a an absolutely demonstrative, you know, impact on on the trajectory of their lives. Most people are eating, according to Dr. Walter Longo, from six thirty seven o'clock in, in the morning when they wake up until eleven o'clock at night. Yeah. Right. They're literally eating themselves right into bed. And so if you're listening to this and you're going, well, that's not really intermittent fasting. Well, it's intermittent fasting for most. And then once you have data, then by all means, tighten your window if you're if you're insulin resistant or you're hyperglycemic or, um, you know, your um, your glycemic profile is out of uh, is out of balance. But if if not, um, and then spreading your meals throughout the day and leaving 12 hours for your body to still enter a state where it's consuming senescent cells and autophagy, then that's that's going to be your best bet totally if you uh if people were to look at any specific markers outside of perhaps glucose like for men looking at testosterone is there some people will say that fasting has this impact on testosterone i've i've seen it go both ways mm -hmm. right in a metabolically unhealthy person sometimes it increases it right mm -hmm. but someone like myself i noticed after i course corrected and became lean and was much more active then fasting started to drop it, right? Yeah. Because it was too much. Mm -hmm. um, what I find interesting is Paul Saladino had said something that's not, I wouldn't even say it's rooted in anything crazy evidence-based, mm -hmm. but it made so much sense talking about that DHEA to cortisol ratio. Mm -hmm. right? Looking at that is, do you think that is a valid way for, let's say someone that is metabolically healthy, mm -hmm. not an athlete, but just a, uh, as crazy as it sounds, that's the minority today, but a healthy mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Is there something that they can look at to say, hey, where should my hormone levels be outside of anything related to uh, to glucose metabolism? Yeah, I'd look at things in the periphery of hormones, you know, um, and then look at their impact on your hormones. I mean, cortisol DHEA ratio is a great example. I mean, um, you know, vitamin D three deficiency, DHEA deficiency. You know, sometimes when you look at a uh, a blood panel and you see people's DHEA in the in the low double digits, um, and depending on age, it could be as high as in the four hundreds. Um, you see this raw material that is a precursor for hormones. And then you see metabolic disruptors, um, proteins in the blood like sex hormone binding protein, SHBG, which can actually artificially lower your free testosterone level when you don't have an endocrine issue. You don't have a, a hypotesticular function or, or, or in women, you don't have a um, testosterone issue per se, but you have these, these other metabolic disruptors or nutrient deficiencies. So my big three for um, hormones, especially for testosterone, would be vitamin D3, DHEA, and sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, because these are very often not included on a hormone panel. 
And so you're looking for why is my testosterone in a great range, but my free testosterone is so suppressed. And because my free testosterone is so suppressed, I'm not getting really the benefits from my beautiful level of testosterone. I'm actually having um, testo uh, testicular hypofunction symptoms. Yeah. And it's not necessarily testicular hypofunction. It's actually these, these other proteins in the blood, like sex hormone binding globulin and what have you. And then I would also look at um, the pituitary's regulation of, of hormone function because, you know, we, we have to remember that in the majority of the cases, you know, it's not the organ that secretes the hormone that determines how much hormone it secretes, right? It's like the testicles don't determine how much testosterone they produce. The thyroid doesn't determine how much, you know, um, T4 and T3 hormone it produces. They have a boss. In both, in both cases, it's the pituitary. And so pituitary has these pathways you can look at too, you know, and, and you can see if the LH and FSH, the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone that the pituitary releases to actually raise sperm production and raise testicular production. You can look at the level of that signal. And very often it's, you know, I, I describe it as like walking into a room and um, you can barely hear the music. And so you don't go over to the speakers and start messing with the speakers because the speaker doesn't determine how loud it plays. The tuner does. And so you find the tuner, you turn the tuner up and the volume increases. The same thing happens in 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 our endocrine system. Very often, it's not the hypo production of a hormone; it is the hypo signaling that's causing the reduction in the production of that hormone. So, you know, there are ways to adjust luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and raise your own hormone level. You know, to be high on your own supply versus you know supplementing from exogenously from outside the body. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And I, I and I don't care what anybody says. I mean, there's no better hormone than one the body produces on its own. I'm with you right? entirely on that. I mean, you crank up crank up a speaker and blow out the speaker, then there's no feedback at all, right? Yeah, so or or bring other speakers in and shut that speaker down. So when you take, you know, things that exogenously I'm a, and I'm a big fan of hormone replacement too. I mean, bioidentical hormone therapy, but you'll never convince me that something that we make bioidentically from a yam is as good as what we produce in our bodies. And um, no matter how identical it is from molecular structure, but so um you know, I th I think that before we go to replacement of anything or chemicals or synthetics or pharmaceuticals, which I'm not anti any of those things, I'm just anti those in as a first line of treatment, because it's not usually as simple when you look at a hormone panel as saying, this is low, so let's just make this high, right? We should really look for the hub of the wheel and say, why is this low? Is there anything that could be artificially suppressing this? Is there any, is there a signaling issue? And then, you know, it's astounding as you correct some of these things and, and hormone levels go right back into the optimal range. And now that person's high on their own supply. And they f that's when they, they get all of the benefits of libido and deep sleep and clear, clean waking energy and cognitive function, good short-term recall and benefits from exercise and all the things that you get from having, you know, an optimal level of hormone. For sure. All right. So we've covered fasting as something you've changed your mind on. What's next? Um, uh, I've changed my mind too on, I, I, I think I've, I've had a changing stance on what I would call um, micro dosing with poisons. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, for years, uh, I was on the side of uh, a lot of my colleagues that say that the dosage determines the poison. Um, and you hear it all the time. Like sometimes when I get called out on social media for, for saying something that might sound like I'm fear mongering and I try not to fear monger, um, they'll say, you know, uh, that's not true because the dosage, dosage determines the poison. And one of the, one of the supplements I call out often is a uh, cyanocobalamin cyanide based B12. And, um, because, very often, it's not the dosage that determines the poison. It's the cumulative dosage that determines the poison. You know, nobody got mercury poisoning from a single piece of tuna fish, right? I mean, they got mercury poisoning because they ate safe levels of mercury. And yes, there are safe levels of mercury, according to the CDC. Um, they ate safe levels of mercury over a prolonged period of time, and that cumulative dosage became toxic. They ate safe levels of um, trace amounts of lead over time, and it became toxic. And so when you look at all of the micro assaults that we're making on our body, I was like, you know, once in a while, it's okay to drink tap water. I won't drink tap water now and unless I was on a deserted island and the only thing around was a tap. <laughs> yeah. um, and the reason for that is, you know, now I see the way that um, the micro dosing of poisons, uh, glyphosates, um, uh, 
you know, fluoride, chlorine in the water, in my opinion, cyanocobalamin. I, I think that the last shoe has not dropped on this cyanide-based supplement that's finding its way into energy drinks and 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 supplements. And again, that's not to be fear-mongering. I mean, there are plenty of of supplements and energy drinks that have the methylated version of that vitamin that yeah. the body's going to convert anyway. And so I've taken a harder stance on um, on is saying it's okay to have small amounts of certain toxic compounds in the body because I think the evidence is starting to shift. You know, GMO foods is another one where you see that, you know, the early evidence was, okay, we're gonna genetically modify this organism to be um, resistant to glyphosate, right? So now the amount of glyphosate that we can put on the plant is considerably more, which increases the concentration that goes into the food supply. And if you look at the research out in around 2009 when this started, they were like, well, this may have negative consequences for um, human consumption. And so they started the animal studies. And then the animal studies in like 2013 started being conclusively um, detrimental. And by 2023, the human studies became very conclusive that these these foods have a detrimental effect on 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 the human body and that there may even be, and I say may even be evidence that certain genetically modified or genetic, genetically engineered foods um, can alter our DNA. Um, so I've taken a pretty hard stance on on GMO foods too. <laughs> Do you think with, with GMO foods, it's uh it's the same situation. It's like a, it's a cumulative buildup, or do you think it's, uh, I mean, since we're talking about potentially altering DNA, is that something that, that happens cumulative, uh, cumulatively, or is that something that can be a, you know, a big bomb drop? Down? Well, one of the things that's, that's becoming very clear is it's making, um, it's making us resistant to um, certain antibiotics. And antibiotic resistance, in my opinion, is about to become a pandemic. Um, and when that happens, because we have overused antibiotics, um, and we've overused them to the point where so many average, and I say average people, I don't mean to classify them, but let's just talk about middle America. Um, you know, course of antibiotics, three, four, sometimes five times a year is absolutely the norm. Um, and, that, and I'm not talking about when they get bad strep throat. I mean, they get a sniffle and bang, they got a Z-pack. Um, and and this is this has disrupted the gut biome. And you look at the, the skyrocketing incidence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and, and you know, these other longer term side effects that come from um, repeated use of antibiotics. And and now you add GMO foods, adding antibiotic resistance um, because antibiotics have their, their, their place for sure. Um, I think that it's, it's not necessarily the genetically modified organism or the genetically engineered organism, um, which may or may not even be food. It's the fact that it now can, that we can carry so much more herbicide and pesticide in the food supply because what used to kill a plant would determine the dosage that we were allowed to use. Well, now if a plant is more resistant, we can use a higher dosage. And now that higher dosage is making its way into the food supply. And so I, I've, I've taken a pretty hard stance on that. I'm, you know, I'm curious, your, curious your take on the organic side of things too, because I, I'm not super well versed in this, but I've heard that Organic isn't always clean either, right? There's True. some there's some nefarious stuff going on there. At least I've heard. I, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in it, but have you heard anything with that? Yeah, I don't. I don't profess to be an expert in organic farming either. I've actually started to go deep down this rabbit hole. I, I just did an, um, uh, a, a podcast and a big expose and, and stage talk with um, uh, Alfie Oaks, who is who's actually one of the largest organic farmers in my state, in the state of Florida. And what was really interesting about his grocery store, which is one of the highest grossing grocery stores in America. It's been named the number one grocery store in America. It's like 65,000 square feet. It's an amazing place. The vegetables that are picked at nine o'clock in the morning are in the grocery store by two o'clock that afternoon. So his field is close to the store. But what was really cool is that he was able, we got on We got on a helicopter, we actually flew out and we, we jumped around 6,000 acres in the middle of the state and actually went down to the soil and he showed me how he is farming and raising organic produce for less than the cost of what most commercial farmers are using industrial fertilizers and industrial pesticides and herbicides for. And, and it was, it was, it was really just a way of getting back to the basics. They hand hoed the, the rows for, for weeds and they actually disoriented these white flies with reflective, um, with these, uh, reflective coverings. So oh, they nice. would take the long rows and rows and rows of vegetables. And instead of, 
spraying them with an insecticide, an herbicide, pesticides, what they would do is they would actually dome the, the, the roots and they would cover them with these reflective, um, they almost look like silver mirrors, almost look like tinfoil. And um, kind of annoying to fly over the field because the sunlight was <laughs> yeah. bending and sort of shooting you in the eye, but it also disoriented the white flies and they headed out towards the woods and didn't destroy the crops. And so he's using none of these chemical wow. fertilizers. But I think just like GMO foods are now starting to be called bioengineered, and when we take fruits and um, out of um, foods, we can actually say artificial fruit flavoring. Yep. So it's yep. like blueberry artificial fruit flavoring, and then you realize, well, okay, well, that's actually a code word for ain't got no fruit. And so, yeah, yeah. and so, you know, what's sad is that, you know, you, you, you walk up to um, you know, you're in the grocery store and you're trying to get something healthy for your kids. And you're like, well, here's this Danon with fruit, you know, with fruit on the bottom. Okay. So it's yogurt, it's probiotics. It's, I mean, it's fruit. Um, that's great for kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you don't realize that it's actually high fructose corn syrup, food coloring to be dyed the color of a fruit, fruit mm -hmm. flavoring to taste like a fruit. Okay. Um, and then you put these, um, you know, you put these artificial sweeteners in that are actually antimicrobial and bacteria are microbial so it actually kills the bacteria and the probiotics so now it actually has no fruit yep. no probiotics none of the bacteria that you want um and it's got 54 grams of sugar and yet you know you it's sold and it's positioned as health food yeah um it's just like fortified or enriched yeah. cereals you know we have folic acid to the cereal which is a man-made chemical and now moms and dads are you know um in the best interest of their kids are going well this cereal is fortified it's enriched and this cereal is not fortified or enriched i'll grab the fortified or enriched one well you just added a chemical to your diet that there's a high percentage chance that your kid can't process that you've also just enabled yourself that everyone's coming to save you all the time right because you're just that's that's the problem that i have with constant fortification is yes there's the actual micro level of what we're talking about but then yeah. the wide angle lens of this is we're enabling an entire generation don't worry Food manufacturers have you yeah. safe. Yeah, you, you can eat this even though it's devoid of nutrients because it's fine. You're gonna eat this. Mm -hmm. They're coming to save you. At the end of the day, no one's coming to save you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's you got to be a citizen scientist. Yeah. It's and it seems like it's this it's this gray line, gray line, gray line until it's eventually gonna be a, a black line. There was like a couple months ago, I was at a, a grocery outlet and there was a product that I you not said it was something with something with fruit and fruit had a asterisk by it. Oh. It was the first I'd ever seen fruit having to have an asterisk by it. And the asterisk indicated that it basically was not really fruit. It was like a percentage, <laughs> yes. a small percentage of fruit. Yeah. So bad that or they- Or fruit actually, flavoring is another one. That they had to put, but they call it fruit. So that's what concerns me is, you know, I don't have a dog in the fight one way or the other with uh, GMOs. I don't pretend to know anything about that. But what I get concerned about is just simple- law of attrition right mm -hmm. like what happens like something that's heavily modified now in five years might might become something that's completely bioengineered and they have to kind of warn on it whereas then organic shuffles into what is now gmo mm -hmm. a true like homesteaded kind of thing becomes organic and then you know it's just <clears throat> everything's yeah. going to kind of shuffle because over time we just kind of get numb to it well, here's here's kind of the good news is um, you know once you once you get good at ingredient label deciphering ingredient labels, um, you, it's not like every time you go to the grocery store you have to go through this myriad of of you know in, intense you know investigation of all of the labels. Once you find the products that fit those categories, you just go back and buy those over and over again. I mean, once you find the nitrate free meats, and once you find the folic acid free and fortified and rich free. Um, um, pastas and, and and breads and flours if you're using and eating those things you know and then you can navigate you know through the maze a little bit easier as so you find the carrageenan free um milks instead of the ones that contain carrageenan you try to get to you know um, raw cheeses and raw milks if you can if you're if you're if you're eating dairy so once you once you learn to navigate that maze here's where i go to get grass-fed meats here's where i go to get pasture-raised eggs here's where i go to get free-range chicken um so now i know that the simple choices that i've made you know going grass-fed pasture-raised free-range um carrageenan free nitrate free it sounds exhaustive in the beginning but after you've been to the grocery store a few times and you you, you sort of brushed up on your on your label reading skills, you, you find those products, you just go back to them over and over and over again. It's not like yeah. a constant, 
you know, um, chore to, to get through a grocery store. No, it, it can be definitely misconstrued online to make it sound like this is, you have to quit your job to be able to figure this out, you yeah. know, and it's, you might have to invest some hours in the beginning, but yeah, I mean, we've got it, we've got it down to a system. You know, yeah. we've got four or five grocery stores we have to go to, which does kind of suck. But yeah. That's also just, you know, there's a lot of things that suck, right? Yeah. So w yes. W what sucks is chronic disease. That's yeah, what sucks. For sure. And, so you know, like and if pick, you look at, pick your suck, right? Yeah. yeah. And then this, yeah, like pick your heart. I see yeah. those out, out there all the time. You know, and, and it, what's astounding to me, you know, I spent 22 years in the mortality space for large life insurance and we studied death i mean we studied what makes people die because in life insurance reverse mortgages annuities i mean the only the only factor that matters um in terms of the duration of a payment or the or until a, a payment is owed is, is how many more months does somebody have left on earth and you know um if i was to boil that entire 22 year career down to a single sentence it would be that the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease and what I mean by that is that if you look at why human beings are not living healthier, happier, longer lives, it in almost every case, it is modifiable risk factors. And so much so that in the tail end of my career, when I would actually be able to artificially manipulate the model for my own curiosity, what if I fix the vitamin D3? What if I fix the anemia that this person has? What if I actually balance the hormone profile? What if I fix the the um, chronically elevated liver enzymes, you would see life expectancy jump. And what really began to stand out to me is that this is entirely under our control, right? These modifiable risk factors are entirely under our control and the masses are not getting the message because the message is coming from big pharma, from big government, um, from food labeling that is intentionally meant to deceive you. Um, most people, when they read natural flavors or fortified or enriched, you know, I mean, those are great terms and it attracts them to those, those products. And, um, you know, I mean, you and I were talking before we came in here about my little wandering through Universal Studios a few yeah. days ago. And um, if you don't believe in the obesity pandemic, just 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 spend a weekend at Disney World. Um, and so I, I was I was I was doing an, an episode on Access Hollywood and I and they picked me up at the back of the park and we wandered our way through the park and I was walking with the, the security guard through there and I jokingly uh, said, um, man, what's with all the fanny packs? It's like a fanny pack pandemic in here. <laughs> like everybody's got a fanny pack on. And his answer just floored me. He goes, oh yeah, they, they, they can't put their hands in their pockets. And I was like, whoa, I never really thought about it that way. And then, you know, I passed like obese grandma, obese mom, obese prepubescent teen, you know, sitting on a park bench, 64 ounce big gulp, funnel cake in, in his hand. That's just like sitting on a sopping paper plate with, with the oil on it. And I, I'm, you know, to me, I'm like, that's child abuse. But I realized they just really don't know. Right. They don't. They don't know, and sometimes the economic question comes into play. But when you're at Universal Studios, you're you're paying fourteen dollars for a funnel cake, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's not like yes. I mean, absolutely. Like socioeconomic factors clearly do play a role, but there are also situations where. I genuinely believe that a lot of these people don't know either. Like, yeah. because otherwise they wouldn't look at that $14 funnel cake and say, well, I'm not going to spend it. You know, if, if it was a $4 funnel cake in a sea of other things that are $20, mm -hmm. I might believe that at Universal, right? But when you're at a theme park and a funnel cake costs as much as, I don't know, it seems to say getting a burger patty or something, right? Right. It's it really leads me to believe that no, there, there's an education piece here right. that, that we're missing. And, and sometimes we live in our own echo chambers online where yeah. we feel like clearly we're reaching people. Okay. Well, you know, our maybe combined 10 million person audience, that's a mm -hmm. sliver. That's nothing, Tiny nothing, sliver. nothing, nothing, nothing. And sliver. you know, we think like, okay, we're reaching people. <laughs> we're not. Yeah. You know? and, and the message should be to educate people enough to inspire them to make a transition, right? I mean, we don't need to educate them enough so that they can, you know, repeat every portion of the Krebs cycle, right? I mean, inside of the mitochondria, because that is super woke biohackers talking to super woke biohackers, right? And, and, but it, the messaging for the masses, you know, 
needs to be one about just movement, hydration, sunlight, you know, basic grounding, maybe introduce them to cold showers, basics of food label, uh, label reading, um, not drinking tap water, um, um, you know, orienting themselves towards or spring water. And, and because, you know, when, when you see the totality that goes on, um, in the the more mortality space and you see all of these modifiable risk factors and that you know sedentary lifestyle everybody knows is the leading cause of all cause mortality and actually was you know sitting is kind of the new smoking Mm -hmm. um and then they go well why don't people just move more they really don't really understand the benefits of just a simple 35 minute walk we just start them there yeah and it's and and exercise being prescribed isn't exactly something that's exciting what they want to do i mean at the end of the day that not we talked about that earlier too it'd be kind of cool if the doctor actually wrote you a script yeah. you went to cvs and picked we'll up your serious. sunlight script and you're like yeah. between this hour and this hour don't do one minute more and what don't do one minute less yeah isn't that you're like well that's just serious you know yeah, if you actually put like parameters on it and you actually like made it this transactional thing people would take it serious versus you know hey like oh yeah well i've got abundant sunshine it's it's totally fine have you ever seen like the uh what is it uh was it the yeah, israeli uh study where they basically had uh they were having issues with parents picking up their kids on time from school. Have you ever seen this? Mm, so, they, but I'm one of those parents, so I'm interested. So, in this. Yeah, so they, yeah, so they were like, okay, <laughs> like you know, we, we really have an issue here, so we're going to start fining you if you uh, don't pick up your kids on time. Well, the parents actually started having much worse results, right? So it's kind of interesting. It's like sometimes, really, yeah. So it's like. <laughs> A bunch of rich parents are like, I don't care. <laughs> rack up the bill. So it's kind of interesting. So it's, it could backfire because it could also be like, well, once they're being told to do something, then it, it enters this transactional part of their brain where it's like, well, it's not my free will to go do this. Mm. So who knows, right? Right. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it, one can only hope. All right. All right so uh, we've tackled two. What's uh, what's the third thing you've changed your mind on here? Um, I would say a third thing I've changed my uh, mind on is long-term keto. Um, and... Uh, I think Paul Saladino has changed his mind on it too. Yeah. Um, and I have seen miraculous changes in in clients that have done keto reset diets. And um, I think, you know, in certain conditions and pathologies, you know, keto can literally be life-saving. And probably not for the reasons that you think. Um, you know, I mean, certainly beta hydroxybutyrate as a fuel source is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, taking off the glycemic load, <clears throat> allowing the pancreas sort of a chance to rest and relax the beta cells, the islets can actually start to produce more sensitive insulin. But what, what, what's really happening at a, you know, mitochondrial level when the mitochondria are producing water is that when we're metabolizing, um, fatty acids, uh, versus carbohydrates, there's a tendency to make a type of water that is called light water or deuterium depleted water. And believe it or not, when when the mitochondria is producing water, and it does make water on about 100 gallons a day, um, and it's really hard for people to really get their arms around that because they go, how does a human being make 100 gallons of water a day? I only drink a half a gallon of water a day. Well, we make it the same way in the mitochondria that we make it in space, right? We take two hydrogens and one oxygen, we slap them together, you have a water molecule. So when it's producing water, um, if there's an extra um, uh, neutron on in that structure, and that extra neutron is called deuterium. And the heavy water or deuterium water that's produced inside of the mitochondria can actually wreck the Krebs cycle, can permanently break it, and which further downstages the ability for it to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the you know the the energy source. And when you're in a, on a, in a state of ketosis, you make light water, you make deuterium depleted water, and I think this has a really healthy effect on cellular metabolism, which might be why I'm postulating, but it might be why the keto diet was, which was originally developed for epilepsy, had such a positive effect on on epilepsy. It might be why um, uh, Dr. Palmer from from Harvard, who was on my podcast a few weeks ago, um, is able to actually treat the most drug resistant psychiatric illnesses with a keto diet, and which I found fascinating, and actually drug resistant psychiatric illness. But prolonged um, keto, um, I've changed my my status on i've changed my position on i don't think that keto is a permanent lifestyle choice even though if you just look at it from the broad aspect of human beings need 
two essential fatty acids, essential for life. You need eight essential amino acids, essential for life. And there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, which my stance was, if you if a carbohydrates are not essential for life, then you don't need them for the rest of your life. Um, and I sort of changed my stance on that. Well, there's a difference between essential and optimal too. Right. Right, like, I mean, you could survive, but right. maybe it's less than optimal, right? Yeah, it wouldn't be a fun diet, two fatty acids, eight essential amino yeah. acids. And yeah. just, I, mean, for the, uh, and I don't for know how long you would really thrive. I mean, eventually something's got to give with that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if, if long-term keto is not really a, a good play, maybe you know over the years, what kind of cyclical approach would you recommend? Um, a 12-week cyclical approach, meaning, um, so for people that have abnormally high triglyceride levels, it's a hard concept to understand that when your blood fat is high, you're gonna go on a high fat diet yeah. to lower the amount of fat in your blood. Um, you know, this, this was a, a hard concept for Dana White when I was working with Dana White initially, um, and most people are familiar with his transition. Uh, you know, to say, you know, Dana, your triglycerides are eight hundred um fasted um and you know this is this is a pretty life-threatening level of triglyceride when you put it in context with everything else the elevated um um, ldl cholesterol the low hdl cholesterol the very high vldl cholesterol um the hyperinsulinemia the um the the uh the very high level of homocysteine the hyper homocysteinemia i mean all of these comorbidities coming together to you know when they converge and they finally touch it's it's a bad scenario in his case um we monitored his blood triglycerides and over a 12 week period of time on really strict keto like very strict keto um and he did keto and intermittent fasting um the the change in his insulin resistance, his glycemic profile, his blood level of triglycerides, and his VLDL cholesterol with the concomitant positive change in HDL cholesterol. The only thing that didn't really drop dramatically was his LDL cholesterol, which I would argue is a marker for longevity. Um, uh, you know, was was because of this twelve week keto reset. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's not uncommon either. And it's like, I remember. Wow, it was probably over a decade ago, like the very first keto podcast I ever heard with Don mm -hmm. D'Agostino and Tim Ferriss. And he was talking, and you know, I think Tim asked the question, he's like, well, how does, <coughs> excuse me, how does someone know that keto is not for them? And he's like, well, I mean, the one clear thing is if they do keto and their triglycerides don't go down. Mm. And if their triglycerides either roughly stay the same or go up, right? Because there's a pretty basic explanation for it it's like if you are for whatever rare reason it's a pretty small hmm. i think, I think I, i'm trying to think, I think why that wouldn't it's happen. i mean if you are for whatever reason have a difficulty or an inefficiency of actually cleaving off fatty acids and actually converting them into ketones okay so in that same you know you could still be producing ketones but you know your triglycerides there's a couple other explanations that he has but at the hmm. end of the day it's essentially an inefficiency and it's not i mean I've never encountered someone, actually I take that back, I've encountered one person that had an elevation of triglycerides in like early stages of keto. Mm -hmm. It can happen over time. Do you think time. they were like true to the keto diet? Because I, I always tell people, a keto diet is something you marry. You yeah, don't just date it. You know, that's, a, that's a tough cheat question. days right? and uh, I've been pretty good this week is is not a, a, a yeah, that's if a good, you're really that's a good using question. it there. You never really know unless you're you know living with somebody, right? Yeah. But I guess my point with that is it's, yeah, generally speaking, I mean, you're conditioning the body to utilize fat as a, you know, a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it would make sense that, yeah, you're going to get more efficient at cleaving off fatty acids and glycerol backbones and ultimately converting ketogenesis. Right. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a hard concept to think about at first because obviously uh, eating fat is associated with, okay, well, that's going to put fat in my blood. I mean, it's yeah. not like you just eat fat and free fatty acids are just abundantly flowing through your bloodstream. People don't realize the storage mechanisms mm -hmm. and how that works. Do you, uh, I, I've had similar feelings with, with keto, obviously as someone that did keto for, I mean, the better part of 10 years and was mm. strict for three years without ever taking a break. And then the last sort of five years, I sort of shifted to more cyclical right. and targeted approaches. And I found that my glucose and whatnot stabilized more by periodically doing keto versus actually being on keto all the time. I think the level of- I would agree with that. The, peripheral insulin resistance, which is not a bad thing, that the peripheral mm -hmm. insulin resistance when you're, you know, low carb or keto or fasting, uh, it was seeming, although as though I was having these undulations that were 
much more rocky than what they are now if I'm cyclical. And it probably has something to do with the, you know, poor glucose tolerance that I was having. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So if I'm right. not giving my body carbohydrates every now and then, then when they do get carbohydrates, my blood sugar is like, whoop, yeah. you know, it's Boom. not sure what to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was talking to Paul Saladino yesterday, and obviously he's become a huge fan of, you know, spiking his insulin. Not as much as he can, but I mean, he's definitely a fan of insulin, which is funny because, you know, two, three years ago, it was like, <laughs> insulin, no, right? Right. But it's a perfect, I mean, it's a perfect example of I, why. I, you know, I admire that when somebody is not so dogmatic about a position that they can't actually say, you yeah. know, I've allowed the data to change my position here. No, he doesn't give a crap. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, it's great. <laughs> like, but it's like why I like to do this series too, because I feel like it gives people an opportunity to say like, hey, like, no, these are things I've shifted on. And like, mm-hmm. we all shift, right? Because mm-hmm. I think in the sphere of people consuming content online, especially in the health world, it's like, heaven forbid, someone watched something in 2015, take it to the bank and never learn again. Right. right? I mean, yeah. like, what if they, what if, what if that was the bee's knees in 2015? And what if we learned something that's really scary in 2024? Yeah. That's where like, hey, like pump the brakes, but they're not willing to look at that because they're not willing to change their mind. Yeah. So, I mean, same thing's kind of happened to me with cold plunging. And I wouldn't call it cold plunging because before we called it cold plunging, we just called it ice baths. Um, yeah. And, um, I, you know, as a human biologist, I, I, I also sit on the board of the NFL Alumni Association. I'm uh, the Alumni Association Athletic. I'm their health services director. And um, so there's 22,000 athletes, former athletes in that o- organization. And I think the prevailing wisdom, including mine, um, or advice is soon, as, as quickly as you're done, really intense exercise, you should immerse yourself in an ice bath. And I think... I think anecdotally, it feels better. Um, you know, you you don't feel as sore. You feel like you've recovered faster. But um, you know, now that the evidence is emerging, that really you don't want to shut down the body's physiologic process, and you st- you take a step back and you and you just look at it holistically, and you say, okay, if I just did a big squat workout and I tore a bunch of quad muscle, what's the body going to do? Well, it's going to send more amino acids, more blood flow, more oxygen, more nutrients to that area. It's going to try to pull creatinine out of that area and other inflammatory factors to really repair the muscle. So why would I want to shut that down? Um, and I think there's evidence emerging now that even getting hyperthermic after exercise yep. and hypothermic prior to, if you really wanted to get hyper precise, yep. um, or at least delaying ice baths till 45 minutes to 90 minutes after your your exercise but i was a huge fan of um and even you know when i was my son was in high school playing varsity football i made all the kids get in you know ice baths as soon as they were done you know intense practice um so i think icing an injury but not submerging the body in in cold water you know yeah, immediately the, po- after the post-acute exercise. phase yeah, yeah i think that, phase. that makes sense and you know but there's also there also is the perception too, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I still know a lot of high level athletes that are like, no, like, I don't care what the literature says. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I feel better, like right after a workout. That is true. I so mean, like, and that counts for something, like seriously, like whether, it, whether they're placeboing themselves into that or not, like, I mean, let's just put all that aside. Like yeah. someone's perception of something, if the ice bath is doing something for them again, like I know a lot of people that are, uh, you know, a couple combine guys right now that are just like, nope, this feels good. But they also, they do it before and after. What's it, But mm. hearing you say that, I have personally noticed that even just 60 seconds of an ice bath prior to a run or prior to lifting mm-hmm. is a game changer. For I think so too. It, yep. It's like, I don't even need much time. Like, it's just like, mm. and I mean, granted I'm super lean. So, I mean, I understand that maybe like, I'm not saying that I can't sit in the thing for a long time, but like I can just dunk in for 60 seconds, maybe two minutes, mm-hmm. but it's like immediately any low back pain I have, things like that. Like I get more pep to my step, literally mm-hmm. speaking when I run. So that's kind of been my thing on the days that I run. It's just like, you know what? I'm going to dunk first yeah, and then I'll just go run. Same, and same for works me. Works out great. Yeah. yeah. I, feel, I feel the same way. And, 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 and I haven't seen much evidence that, or any evidence really that um, colder is better or longer is better. And I think, you know, a lot of these biohacks we take to the extreme. I mean, if we're not trying to become cold adaptive, we're only trying to cold shock the body. Yeah. Um, you know, three minutes minimum, six minutes maximum at 48 to 50 degrees is is a great sweet spot for cold water immersion and cold plunging. And yes, maybe if you made it, made it colder, you could do it shorter, but why torture yourself? I mean, yeah. you know, 48 to 50 degrees, three minutes minimum, six minutes maximum. I think you get, um, you know, the 
the maximum cold shock protein release, um, you, you you get the peripheral vasoconstriction, you get the brown fat activation. Um, I would argue that you get an increase in, in your metabolism. I would also argue that you have um, positive effects on fatty acid metabolism and, and that cold plunging actually can contribute to weight loss, even though there hasn't been a um, randomized clinical trial on it. But if you stack all of the data up and you say, well, if, if um, brown fat activation, which is exchanging a calorie for a measure of heat, um, so there's a caloric cost to creating heat. We don't get heat for free. We have to, there's a cost to it. Even the law of thermodynamics would say that, that you have to convert the energy from somewhere. So we convert it from a calorie into a measure of heat. Um, you see that there are cold shock proteins. I mean, I think it's LIN28 and 28A and LIN28B, which are related cold shock proteins, but both have a positive effect on insulin resistance. Um, so if you have a positive effect on insulin resistance, you raise your metabolism. We know that it improves your, your mood and your emotional state. We know, we know that it raises endorphins, dopamine specifically, um, two and a half times with the level of, of, of dopamine. And you get a brown fat activation, you get this peripheral vasoconstriction. I mean, it's it, there are immense benefits from it, but then we take it to the extreme and we're like, well, if three to six minutes is good, then 12 minutes is better. And if 48 degrees is good, 37 degrees is better. Yep. And I've seen videos on 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 Instagram quite often, actually, where pe people get in 37 degree water and go underwater with a snorkel um, for 12 minutes. And I'm like, you know, you gotta remember that your brain is this far inside the surface of your skull, right? Yep. It's really not good to freeze it and it's not good to bake it. Yep. So, you know, prolonged very high heat exposure yep. um, or prolonged very cold uh, exposure is that, you know, in my opinion, not, not necessary and should for be sure. a thing. No, I mean, I want to, you know, double click on that for a second because that's like with the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting, man, because the, uh, the cold <laughs> stuff, uh, first I want to back up for a second. I do think obviously a lot of this stuff, there's opposing sides. Everyone mm -hmm. likes to have their fight with it. I notice if I'm on a cold plunging game, that my mental willpower is stronger. I have the ability. No so question. That is one thing that I don't think people can really deny. Mm -hmm. Is like if you have the ability to withstand something that's just uncomfortable, those things definitely translate other, into other aspects of your life. It's kind of like I used to tell people, you know, back in the day, like. I'm not worried about counting calories, but if you just write down what you eat, the simple act of having some discipline with it, that mm -hmm. translates into other areas of your life. You know, we used to talk about that with like, okay, you, you want more success in business? Well, you know what? Maybe you need to just get priorities in order in other places and it allows you to kind of think a better different mm -hmm. way, right? I've noticed that with cold plunging, right? It's just, it's something where it sucks and being able to deal with something that kind of sucks mm -hmm. helps you resist temptation. I, I totally mean, agree. So, that's like, for me, it's just, it's a gut check for myself. Yeah. It's like, Thomas, like, come on, get out of your element for a second and like get down to earth for a second. This is going to suck. Let's do something that sucks because working out doesn't really suck for me anymore. I enjoy it. I love it. I'm addicted to it. So yeah. it doesn't really suck. So I can't do that anymore. So now well, I can still do that, but I can't look at that as my like suck dosage for the day. Right. I <laughs> suck dosage. So it's, <laughs> I don't know if you work out hard enough. It's why I used no, to like CrossFit. Cause I like, I felt like at some point, if you didn't yeah. want to quit, you weren't doing it. Yeah, good. but the, the, <laughs> the suck with like CrossFit, and that's kind of how I train too. High injury, it's, yeah. Well, no, no. It, 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 well, for the average person, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, so I was going to say. Compound I, Olympic movements like for you actually soccer moms. At, we could go down that rabbit hole, but like, I, I guess I'm, I'm not, I don't even do official CrossFit, but I look at like the CrossFit thing and I say, it's so frustrating because if you talk to like an orthopedist, they're going to say like, oh yeah, CrossFit keeps me in business. So like, well, how many other people do you see from football, from ski, from mm -hmm. this. And then what yeah. percentage is actually cross? So it's like the only issue I have with CrossFit is maybe telling someone to do, you know, submaximal lifts after they've run 400 repeats or something. Right, 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 right. But that being said, the thing with a sucky workout <laughs> that makes you want to quit, you're still loving it. There's something deep down, right? There's something mm -hmm. about a cold plunge. I don't and love it. everything about it no, sucks. No, no, no. So, yeah, there's yeah. never a part of it where yeah, I'm just no, like that's so true. Like so, like a workout. I'm just like ah, this is cool. At least there's an ego drive. At least there's like you're sitting in a cold. Get the pump in the mirror. Yeah, there's no ego drive. <laughs> you're sitting there like a little pathetic, like wimp, like you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's just it doesn't. It's not the same. But yeah. it's. Uh, but what I wanted to touch on was the uh, hot water immersion versus like sauna for a second because this was interesting because I talked to uh, Rhonda Patrick about this and she. She's definitely hasn't pivoted. She's obviously very pro sauna, as am I. I'm huge mm -hmm. on like you know getting hyperthermic and uh, being able to do that. But mm -hmm. 
then Dom D'Agostino last week was telling me too, he's like, yeah, like I've shifted much more towards just doing a hot tub. And like, he's like, when you look at being able hot to- Hot tub. Like, like a nice hot, hot tub, right? Mm. So like sitting in a hot tub. And uh, it's kind of wild because they're talking about heating the brain, right? And they're yeah. like, you're, you're you're heating your CPU. You know, you're you're like, like this right. is, people are talking about, uh, you know, potentially frying your CPU so your immune system's out of whack. And you're talking about the pituitary as being this like, you know, tuner for everything else, right? Um, and it's so hard to look at data when you've got like the Finns and the Danes and whatnot, and they, you know, they sit in saunas. They're also wearing wool hats that are protecting their head, like they're mm -hmm. creating an extra, yes. an extra layer. Yep. I've got one of those now. And I think that's super important. Yep. But Dom had mentioned, and I haven't double checked it, but he's like, the literature is actually saying to heat the brain in a proper way to create that intracranial pressure uh, and the glymphatic sort of drainage and clearance that you mm -hmm. want. He's like, the evidence actually suggests that hot water immersion, like sitting in a hot bath in a hot tub might actually even be better mm -hmm. sitting in a sauna because it's I've actually creating that. a pressure sort of right so and there's a like pressure gradient essentially so this is really interesting so um there's no real way for me to test it out other than just my I, own experience i think like, it, you know when you go anecdotally off just how you feel yeah um but i bake in a hot bath and that's the thing is you can sit there i don't get out of a hot bath and go wow i feel but, amazing like i want to yeah no it's well i'll use on the world crank it up i mean it's not to the point where i'm scalding but it's hot right right and then i'll go in there and i'll i'll meditate for 15 minutes or something and it's like trying not to move when you're that it's uncomfortable it's more uncomfortable than sitting in a sauna in mm. a sauna i'm kind of like oh you're talking really hot yeah well i'm not not to again not to the point where i'm like right completely like never gonna have kids again kind of thing. Right. Well, <laughs> but it's to the point where it's uncomfortable i'm right. i'm sweating significantly right. and i'm like you know i can see like because immersing yourself in water hot or cold is going to change your internal temperature much faster than ambient yeah cold 29 air. times the rate of air it's 29 it times yeah. more thermogenic than air. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of making, not that I'm anti-sauna. I have a sauna, like everywhere I go, I try to have a sauna set yeah. up. But I'm starting to see the benefits of a hot bath a lot. Hmm. I have to dig into that. I don't know if I've, I, I didn't have a stance on it, so I couldn't have changed my stance on it. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> but definitely changed it on cold plunging too. Well, uh, Gary, where can everyone find you, man? Uh, you can find me at uh, theultimatehuman.com um, or on Instagram, my first and last name, at Gary Brecca. Perfect. Right on, brother. Awesome, man. This was great. Yeah.